It's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrove, and along with my co-host, David Feldman. David, it is 500 episodes. Over nine and a half years, this is episode number 500. That's why I'm wearing a bow tie and nothing else. <laughs> oh, boy. Ah, so glad we're on radio. And we have the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Hello, Ralph. 500 episodes, Ralph. Hello, everybody. Well, the 500 episode is going to deal with workers and unions by a union leader who really speaks his mind. You know, we've talked a lot about the Writers Guild strike on this program. That strike is over, pending the ratification of the deal reached between the Guild and the major studios. And we may have the funniest picket signs, but there's a lot of other labor action going on across the country. Auto workers, hotel workers, hospital workers, service workers, and actors are all flexing their labor muscles. For the first time in a long time, the labor movement seems to be playing offense instead of defense. This doesn't just happen in a vacuum. It takes a lot of organizing. Our guest today, Chris Townsend, is a veteran trade union organizer. He even runs an organizing school. Organizers like Chris usually work far under the radar, but we've asked him to step up to the mic. So today, he'll join us to discuss the details of his work, as well as the labor battlegrounds we should keep an eye on. As always, somewhere in the middle, we'll check in with our relentless corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokiver. But first, let's talk about a labor movement on the offensive. David? Chris Townsend is a 44-year trade union worker and organizer. He is the retired political action director for the United Electrical Workers Union and was the International Union Organizing and Field Director for the Amalgamated Transit Union. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Chris Townsend. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Chris, you know, we've had many discussions over the years in Washington, D.C. about the state of the labor movement. And you were working, it's time for the United Electrical Workers, which arguably is the most honest union in America. The head of the union for years never made much more than what an electrician of many years' experience would make. But we would talk about why union membership was declining, why the union leadership, including the AFL-CIO, wasn't aggressive enough They were too obesant to the Democratic Party, which was turning corporate year after year. And you were pretty frustrated. But now you've retired from the United Electrical Workers. You're more optimistic. You're more upbeat because there are all these union organizing efforts, many of them by young people in their 20s at Starbucks, at Amazon warehouses and elsewhere. And we all see that as spontaneous. But what you're saying is that there are traditional unions that are putting workers in these stores and warehouses for the clear purpose of galvanizing the rest of the workforce into signing up to form a union. Can you elaborate on that? You told the corporate crime reporter, it was like putting a handful of salt into a pot of water, knowing that by salting the water, it will boil a little bit faster, end quote. Yeah, thank you, and thanks for that introduction. Yeah, I mean, the situation that we face, I mean, I've been a union man since I got out of high school. I bypassed college, or it bypassed me, and, you know, I'm one of probably some thousands of union organizers out here that are grinding away, but of course, we're never heard from. We're invisible. The media avoids us. They would rather select other people to speak for us, and spin their tails, sometimes correctly, sometimes not. But but it's important to hear from some of the actual organizers on the ground because things are changing and it's long overdue. I think it was already mentioned here, the significant, not dramatic, but the significant uptick in strike struggle is the result of strikes that have been suppressed for so long. And bargaining is, you know, you conduct it as best you can, but the laws of the land are weak that protect workers and would force the laws and they're not enforced. So strike struggle is overdue. I don't think that there has been anything but, you know, righteousness associated with the Writers Guild strike, screen actors, the railroad strike, which was broken by Biden's foul hand. And we're certainly facing a strike struggle at UPS. 
my union, UE, has just ended a two-month strike at the biggest locomotive manufacturing plant in the United States, Wabtec, up in Erie, Pennsylvania. And in my time, after I retired from the UE, which was hard for me to do, but I returned to a union I had been when I was first a teenager, which was the Amalgamated Transit Union. But I went back as the organizing director and the field director. And it was a moment in time that I saw and I grabbed it. You know, the ring only comes around, you know, infrequently in your life. And I became the organizing director and was the most successful organizing director, new organizing director in the history, recent history, at least the living memory of that union. And I began to sense that there were changes afoot, demographic, uh, political, overdue, piled up business that workers were finally, you know, being forced to respond to. And after, you know, I think the first 30 years of my time in the labor movement was almost all defensive, fighting one rear guard action after the other, trying to hang on to whatever we could hang on to. But then here we come into the current decade and we begin to see some offensive action now. One of the things, and I explained to the corporate crime reporter that we had done in my time at ATU was when Larry Hanley was the president of that union, when he was still alive, he passed away. But it was Larry Hanley, myself, and long established U.S. organizer, Richard Bensinger. And we put our heads together and we said, we need to experiment with something more bold, more aggressive, and maybe set an example, maybe pull some folks along with us. And we began a small organizing school, sort of an informal collective. We call it the Inside Organizing School. We began it at the very end of 2017. And it was an unusual school in that it was sponsored by, initially it was sponsored by the Amalgamated Transit Union, but it was a multi-union school. And one of the things that we did was to put a very heavy emphasis on trying to design campaigns where we could send people into these workplaces to help initiate or salting. Salting is not a new thing. It's nothing we invented. It's as old as the trade union movement. I had been a salt as a young man in six different workplaces, you know, when I was young enough to have the energy to do that kind of thing. And in any case, it's really, as you said, Ralph, it's a way to move it along faster. It is not a substitute for a trade union leadership that would seriously launch campaigns of organizing, but it is at least something that we can do as the left wing in the labor movement, whatever there is of it, to push on the union and to initiate campaigns. So we ended up having a number of successful campaigns by pulling together, you know, seasoned, experienced, aggressive trade union organizers, bring them together with, frankly, some of the younger faces that are emerging by the hundreds of thousands from the workplaces, from the colleges, and we see them, you know, throughout, you know, society, you know, playing their role as new leftists, frankly. And we combined some of these folks with some, with an experienced eye, and we were able to initiate a tremendous amount of trade union activity, Starbucks among it. And I was just as surprised as anyone else that it caught on. But I think what we're responding to is a younger workforce that is assessing the future and its bleak for them, unless there's some movement building here and trade union struggle conducted to push back against these employers and push back against these degraded and degenerate governmental forces who sponsor these corporate forces. You know, everyone well, here knows none of these situations exist absent support from the government or at, at worst, total neglect. Well, we're going to talk about the anti-union laws led by the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947, which the Democrats have never made a serious effort since then to repeal when they were controlling Congress. But the tide of public opinion has turned in favor of labor unions now. Majority of the American people have a favorable view of unions, even though not more than one out of 10 workers in the U.S. belongs to a union. And another poll showed that the vast majority of the working class, between 70 and 80 percent, would gladly join a trade union if the opportunity presented itself. But I think what most people don't realize is you can have a successful union drive in a workplace, a factory, or a chain store locations, and the, the union can be certified by the National Labor Relations Board 
But nothing happens unless there's a contract negotiated and signed by the employers and the union. And that's where the hurdle really emerges, because after an exhausting effort to combat union-busting efforts by corporate law firms infiltrating workplaces and dividing and ruling, spreading a lot of propaganda and fear, the petition drive succeeds and it gets certified as a union, the employers can start delaying negotiation for months and years. And one of the reasons this is possible is because we have the most anti-union laws in the Western world. So what would you do if you were telling Congress to reform the labor laws? How would you do it? Yeah, there would be a number of things, and uh, I'll just build out, Ralph, some of the awful truth there about what it is. We have seen in recent decades a dramatic decrease in the number of union elections. Now, let's get it on the record, everybody here, that you only get a union election when you've already run through the withering fire from the employer. Virtually none of these employers in the United States will respect your right to organize, I assert and we continue to run our organizing school, and this is how I open the school, by declaring what everyone agrees, which is the workplace in the United States is a dictatorship. And if you're willing to challenge that dictatorship, create a rebellion against it, you might be able to build a union. But if you look at the statistics, the number of elections, the number of those campaigns that actually get that far, which is only a small number, most of them are incinerated, liquidated, poison gassed, fired, terminated out of existence before you ever get that election. But if you get that election, the labor movement is winning, depending on which statistics you want to use, winning about half of those elections. Now, that may seem encouraging to some, but if you study the size of the units that are voting in those elections, in other words, how many people in those workplaces, compared to 30 and 50 years ago, the size of the units has also dramatically shrunk. So we're bitten from both ends. We have fewer elections that are being run, and then we have most of those elections, including far, far fewer people. So, of course, with a very aggressive and a pathologically anti-union corporate elite in this country, we've seen what some would call the decline of the labor. Not the decline of the labor, but it's the, you know, the deliberate destruction and repression of the labor movement. And it leaves us in this situation where then you come to the politicians. And there are many things that they can do, the vast majority of which they won't do. Everyone here is aware the Democrats have had a majority in, for at least two years in four recent presidents, and they will not move the kinds of legislation that we need in order to at least begin to address the labor rights crisis in this country. And we also have a situation where, and I, I laugh out loud when Joe Biden puts the crown on his health, a la, you know, a la Napoleon here, and declares himself to be the most union president in the United States history. Well, it's absurd on its face. This man doesn't do anything. He went up to Michigan because Donald Trump was going to beat him there. He didn't do it. But this man could do many, many things as the president to enforce. For example. Mechanism. For example, well, let's get some companies' names out here. Starbucks, Amazon. I could mention 150 others engaged in systematic repression of the workers' rights, violation of the law on a wholesale basis. Where is the Department of Justice investigating this conspiracy to mass repress people's rights? Now, maybe there's legal scholars that would sit around and say, well, I don't know if that's really against the law. Well, that's the law that matters to working people and matters to the labor movement. Biden is the president. He could put that machinery into motion become incredibly aggressive. He could summon these CEOs to the White House and read the riot act to them. Now, let's get it on the record. When he crushed cynically and ruthlessly the railroad strike, a strike that was 40 years overdue, a strike where workers in large measure were voting to be able to take a day off. So we see industrial serfdom in that industry has sort of returned. But what did Biden do? He didn't do anything. He undermined the strike. He could have led that strike. I think maybe after his trip to Michigan and his handlers, I think maybe they realized that had they led that railroad strike from the top, it would have been incredibly popular, incredibly successful, and he would have actually looked like a legitimate leader. But instead, he tries to have it both ways. He likes to talk a little bit about it, but he doesn't want to actually do anything. And putting the machinery into motion 
to prosecute this wave of corporate crime. Of course, you know, Ralph, your entire career, you've seen, you know, how the they let off the gas pedal, so to speak, when it comes to actually enforcing law. Same problem is uh, with the labor rights situation. But one of, one of the th- abuses that you're talking about is that companies regularly fire yes. the leaders of union organizing efforts in the workplace. And under the weak labor laws, if the fired worker can afford a lawyer and get reinstated, all they do is get back pay, and that may take three, four years. So it's almost never a situation where these fired workers are reinstated. And he hasn't, he hasn't spoken out against that from the no, White exactly. House. Exactly, and, and let me add a little bit to what you brought up there. Workers are fired in a shockingly high number of union organizing drives. Frequently, that information is never collected because the union drive may never even get out of the crib so that it may not even make the statistics. I, as a you know, 44-year union organizer, either as a worker in the shop or as a staff organizer in several unions, I have personally seen thousands and thousands of people fired. And, you know, I remember, what, 2018, I live in Alexandria, Virginia. My union, the ATU, when I was the organizing director, we organized the city-owned private bus company. And it was one whale of a fight. Now, this is a city completely controlled by Democrats. Let's get that on the record. But once we won that election, after confronting rank racist union busting and enormous expenditure for this, once we succeeded in winning just for spite the employer, the Dash bus system in Alexandria, fired both of our union and LRB election observers. Even though they had lost the election, they fired both of them. Well, only one of those workers went back to work. One walked away and said, to heck with it. But the piece that I wanted to add, Ralph, to what you had said, even if a worker today, when they're fired, has the stamina to hold their breath long enough to go through the sometimes multi-year NLRB legal process, to eventually find that they're being ordered back to work. First of all, many employers appeal that for more years, or even if they are ruled back to work and the employer consents, that worker is only awarded back pay minus their earnings. What is earnings? Unemployment compensation or other jobs that they had. So it's quite frequent that workers never are entitled to any back pay or no significant back pay. Let's be very, very realistic here. I don't think there can be a labor union movement in the United States under present federal laws. It's just there are just too many hurdles, too many delays, too many licenses for these corporations to bust up the situation. They have endless money to pay specialized corporate law firms who are skilled at infiltrating and intimidating and obstructing essentially defenseless workers who have no backing trying to organize a factory or a chain store. I don't think it's possible. And and I'm amazed that you can listen to what the FFL puts out, what labor unions leader put out. They almost never mention card check. They never mention repealing Taft-Hartley. They don't force the Democrats who get elected in no small part because of union support to put these labor law reforms in place. I had a meeting with Richard Trumka when he was head of the AFL-CIO, and he told me during the John Kerry candidacy against George W. Bush in 2004, he said, just give me card check, and I'll organize huge numbers of workers. And Kerry said, yes, I will support, if elected, card check. And Obama said, yes, I would support card check. And they never said anything after that. Now, tell the American people what a card check is and how it could facilitate union organizing. Sure. A card check would be an alternative to an election. Everyone says, well, an election sounds like a fair way to do it. No, it's not. The workplace is a dictatorship. It is inherently coercive to have to work for somebody. You have very few rights, even even if they were enforced. You don't run things. You don't challenge the employer. You do what they tell you to do. After they have hired you, you know, you have no control over that hiring process. So once you're there, you're at their mercy. So in order to try to pretend or continue to pretend that these union elections are somehow legitimate elections is preposterous. And I blame, in many cases, the labor leadership in this country for allowing this farce to play out as long as it has. 
Think about it here, folks. In order to explode the illegitimacy, the lopsided nature of these so-called union elections, what election can anyone think of where there are two sides? There's the pro-union side and the anti-union side. And one side, the employer, doesn't even have the right to participate in the election. You know, no Democrat, no Republican would ever accept the kinds of election conditions for their own election that we as workers are forced to accept in terms of this, where one side, the employer, can pay people to sit through the, your speeches, can sit there and be subjected to your threats, that one side in that equation can you know, physically fire people and remove them and punish people, intimidate them, and then at the end of that process claim that somehow this is a fair process. It's nonsense. I don't know who believes it. I sure don't. I don't think most workers believe it either. So in any case, a card check would be a, an expedited process where the very act of signing a union card and joining the union would then be tallied up in a legitimate... Isn't this what they do in Western countries? With labor, they, they don't have these elections that are rigged. They just have a majority of the workers sign up or a supermajority sign up. Isn't that true? In some countries, yes. And, and I should say, even in the United States, the card check process is where if a majority of people have signed their union card as checked against the payroll sheet, you know, the number of employees and the, the union is granted recognition. That does happen here occasionally in certain situations, even a little bit in the public sector. But it's, it's not the promotion of that as a tactic, as a structural change, as you found out, Ralph is lost. And I again, I hold the labor leadership at all levels in this movement of ours, what's left of it, responsible for not keeping this issue in front of the politicians that they fund and help it get elected. But this is a forgotten. The card check's not even talked about anymore. And you had mentioned, Ralph, a few minutes ago, the Taft-Hartley Act, which would not be the only problem that we face, but it contains as a package some of the very destructive facets. This well, has... let's, let's talk about Taft-Hartley in the context of the current UAW strikes, the auto worker strikes that are starting against the uh, auto companies. Let's talk about the ban on secondary boycotts in Taft-Hartley, which prevents other unions from helping beleaguered unions trying to get a better contract for a decent livelihood. Tell us, what is a secondary boycott that is now illegal? It would be the picketers from the struck plant traveling to other corporations, workplaces that were doing business with their company and then picketing them uh, and asking for support from their workers, perhaps staging a, a strike in sympathy. And this was a common tactic, a very effective tactic, and it was banned as part of the reaction against the 1946 strike wave and that kind of came together by 1948 as what became known as the Taft-Hartley Act. And that's one of many destructive, insidious aspects. The, the whole phenomenon of what's known as right to work, the fact that a union is unable to compel the workers in, it's about 26 or seven states now, on the private side to contribute anything financially towards the cost of representing them. Even though those workers have the complete freedom to demand representation. They receive everything that is negotiated, but there's no financial obligation. Anyway, that right to work phenomenon is another dastardly component of the right to work package of really destructive legislative attacks on labor. But again, I, I don't recall the last time, other than my union, UE, I was also a 25-year staff with the United Electrical. They remember Camp Hartley. They think about it. It has meaning to them. I don't know how many other unions or union leaderships even think about this anymore. What's wrong with the leadership of the AFL-CIO ensconced in that big building on 16th Street in Washington, D.C., a block from the White House? We don't see a recognition of the conflict that they're in. They represent union workers who don't have to worry about the minimum wage of $7.25 an hour federal. They represent union workers who usually have pretty good health insurance plans. So how do you expect them to represent the 90% of the workers who are not unionized and are being driven into the ground, many of them, in so many ways, with minimal benefits, non-livable wages, and so on? How do you expect 
the FLCIO to turn around if they're not surrounded by pickets of workers saying, you're not representing us. You're not fighting for us. You're following the corporate Democrats. You don't talk about $15 minimum wage except for SEIU, which started the effort and showed what could be done. What's wrong with these people in this big building on 16th Street? Give us your forthright reaction to that, Chris. You know a lot about what's going on there. Well, I would submit that the vast majority of working people in the United States have no idea what the AFL-CIO is. The few that might, the small percentage that might, might have an opinion about it. The labor leadership in this country is invisible. And that was somewhat of, a, of an annoyance for them up until the last decade or two. And, and, and in fact, the leadership of the AFL-CIO, is, which is, you know, it's the sum of the affiliates. So you have, I believe it's 60 unions who comprise the AFL-CIO Federation of Unions, and then you have several officers and leaders, and now led by Lee Schuler from the Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. You know, these folks that conduct the business and act as somewhat of a de facto spokesperson for the labor movement. But the fact that they have been submerged into invisibility, I think they're very comfortable with it. And we know that the Democratic Party has a hotline to the AFL-CIO building. We know that an unknown but significant number, unknown because it's never released, but never made public, but a significant number of the executive council of the AFL are members of the Democratic National Committee. I've never been able to find out who sits on that Democratic National Committee or how many labor leaders are on it, but the the organizational tentacles of the Democratic Party reach deeply into a growing number of unions. And this is what leads to the farcical early, record early endorsement of Joe Biden many months ago, 17 months out from the election, on a voice vote with no debate, no announcement that it was going to come up. And then it was kind of a rush job to then not even talk about it. And my understanding was- And didn't was ask anything in return. It was unconditional support of course, of Joe yeah, Biden of course, without anything right. in return. That's right. Which says something about the bargaining skills of these so-called union leaders. My understanding was there was one, possibly two dissenting votes in that voice vote. And then it was immediately put to bed and act, you know, it's find no trace of it almost. And this is just another visual reminder of how subordinated the general trend of the labor leadership is to the Democratic Party. Now, I will say, if you corner any of these folks and you talk to them, most of them will confess readily that we're in a bind and that the Democrats are unreliable and that they won't produce or don't produce, or maybe they they bailed out my union once or they passed this, which we want to recognize and it's helpful. Yeah, those things are worthy of note. But the general trend is complete neglect or even joining in on the beating, so to speak. And the fact that the AFL-CIO sat still as Biden crushed the railroad strike, just one of the most shameful chapters in recent years. That they And some of them even tried to rationalize. And that was a strike that was righteous. It was long overdue. Those four corporations, it's a monopoly industry of epic proportions. That industry is so overdue for a convulsion like a labor strike, you know, it's sad. And they're endangering the public, as the uh, yes. crash in uh, Ohio showed. They want to reduce the number of people running a train to one. And it's now two or three, these freight trains. And what's at stake here is uh, the existence of American labor. The, the global corporations want to replace it, all of them with robots, artificial intelligence, whatever you want to call it. They don't make any bones about it. Jeff Bezos would like to have the whole warehouse run by robots. They don't like workers. Robots don't make any demands. And that's part of what the United Auto Workers are fighting against, that they're going to lose their jobs, never mind not get adequate pay. I liked the speeches that are being made by the head of the United Auto Workers, Thane. He's bringing in the executive salaries. Mary Barra makes $29 million a year, the highest ever paid auto executive, which comes up to maybe fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 an hour, and they're paying low-tiered auto workers 20 bucks an hour, 22 bucks an hour, and the veteran auto workers maybe up to 33 bucks an hour, and she's getting over $14,000 an hour. 
not counting benefits and perks. There's a long history. The UAW had weak leadership. They had some corruption. There was the GM bankruptcy, the bailout under Obama in 2012 by the taxpayer of GM and Chrysler. And the UAW had to agree to two tiers where the younger workers started out doing the same work as the older workers, but getting much less pay, not to mention other concessions the union had to make. So this is makeup time for the UAW, which is why they have so many support support around the country for what they're doing. And they're not just fighting for themselves, but the view ahead is very worrisome in the sense that, you know, once you get away from home health workers, plumbers and electricians, they're trying to automate everything, including white collar jobs, no longer just blue collar jobs. If they can't export the jobs under these corporate managed trade agreements to fascist and communist dictatorships overseas, who know how to put their workers in their place? So it all comes down to whether this is going to become not just a labor movement, Chris, but a political movement that enlists all Americans who have a stake here in having decent livelihoods and deconcentrating a corporate-dominated economy into local economies where they're not controlled by absentee rulers in London, Tokyo, Chicago, New York, and what have you. What do you see there in terms of turning the labor movement into a political movement at election time? Well, I'll start by commenting that I could not be more proud of uh, relatively new president, Sean Fain, from the auto worker. Any of you that follow the twists and turns that played out in that union, which led to his election, would have to be elated. And what we're seeing with this strike is finally the unleashing of the anger, the righteous anger of the huge swath of the membership in that union for what has been done to them over the last 40 years. Now, it it strikes me as if it wasn't such high stakes, it would strike me as comical uh, that Joe Biden and his handlers discover that this is a big slice of the workforce that they have ignored at best or even participated in abusing over the decade that were. So now they suddenly find out that their probable opponent, Trump, is going to go out and get there a day ahead. So they had to run and catch up. And we all saw how long Mr. Biden spent on the picket line, minutes. But he did go. This is worthy of note. But the issue here is, what is he going to do to compel these corporations to concede to these just, reasonable demands of these workers? And beyond that, Ralph, as you point out, the history of auto negotiations is not complicated. It's the history of all manufacturing negotiations. The employers have already decided they are leaving. It's just a matter of how quickly they do it. It should get on the record. There's more auto workers in Mexico today than in the United States, unionized or unorganized. And this is the political neglect or willing conspiracy with these big companies to deindustrialize the United States. It's a process that's been very successful in my lifetime, and it has a ways to go, but it seems to be doing. So one of the things that the Biden administration needs to do is you know put tremendous pressure on the unorganized corporations to allow their workforces to organize if they want to, and most of them would, and again, to insert into that situation and prevent the union busting and whatnot, which all of the unorganized auto companies use. I'll remind everyone that just a few months ago in Buffalo, New York, the Tesla Corporation fired 40 workers in one of their plants in Buffalo. He boom, crushed the union drive in five minutes. That'll never be adjudicated to any great effect. But instead, that corporation is fed the mother's milk of subsidies that are difficult to comprehend. So the bad behavior is actually rewarded in many cases by these political leaders. And, and, you know, this auto strike is really the creation of the Biden administration in some part because of their uh, virtually unlimited subsidy of the electrical vehicle industry, which the United Auto Workers is not opposed to. But what it realizes is what good is it to bargain a contract with the big three, settle it, have the first paycheck come with the improvements, and then see, you know, another third of your members laid off with plant closings and transfers to unorganized plants. You know, it's a much more comprehensive crime 
being committed against working people. And as long as we get platitudes, we get the ridiculous, you should have a fair contract. These are meaningless platitudes. What we need is a real serious presidential effort to really rein in this wave of corporate crime. Let's talk about the workers themselves. You got about 40% of union workers voted for Trump in 2020 after they knew that his promises in 2016 were as phony as a $3 bill, and his whole business career was anti-worker, anti-union to begin with. And let's say he sold them a bill of goods with his bloviated rhetoric in 2016. What's the excuse for 40% of the unions voting for Trump in 2020? Is it because the union leaders are not educating the rank and file. They don't meet with them. They don't have, like they used to in the old days, book clubs. The union newspapers are extinct. They used to go out weekly. How do you explain it? You certainly don't exonerate that kind of political masochism, do you, on the behalf of 40% of the union workers? Yeah. In certain unions, it's more than 40%. And I should say, uh, listeners may not know this, but most unions conduct extensive polling of their members. Now, that calls into question what kind of a union leader would have to poll their members to get connected to them or find out what they're thinking. But the modern large union will do this. I suppose it has its merits. And when these polls come back, this is something that's gone on for several decades at least, it's very worrisome for many of the union leaders because they see large, large sections of their membership who are supporting overtly anti-union politicians like Trump, for instance. But I'll tell the story, my own personal story on, uh, what was it, January 7th of, what was it, 2021, I guess, when we had uh, the day before, we had the, you know, the fascist hordes storming the Capitol and whatnot. I called the president of the Amalgamated Transit Union, and I said, we have to do something to educate our members. We knew that there was a large section of our members in the Amalgamated Transit Union that were sympathetic or supportive of Trump, and even worse. So what are we doing? Are we going to run an educational campaign? Are we going to make a systematic effort to go out and engage in conversation about the political realities and whatnot? Well, nothing was done. Nothing was done. And in most of the unions, nothing is done and nothing will be done. So it's just uh, they leave the members up for grabs. They don't make any effort to connect with them. They cancel their magazines. They cancel their newspapers. They, you know, they, they post a website and just say, go online and you'll learn everything you need to know. And it is a woeful neglect that has led to this situation where we cannot, there may only be eight and a half, nine percent of the workforce that's unionized, but we can't count all of those folks as active, conscious union leaders and supporters. We see this erosion when our leadership so systematically neglects the education. And then on on the two-party trap, Ralph, you know, look, nobody knows that any better than you. And, you know, that this is a, a trap that we're in. And it, you have to struggle against it. But first of all, you have to recognize it. You'll never challenge it if you're not even willing to recognize it. And this is a perversion of, it's a, I guess you could call it sort of a variation of democracy, but it's certainly nothing that has ever served working people very well. And it needs to be challenged. But again, if you're never engaging in a conversation with your members and their extended families and whatnot about how this system is structured to work against you, then it only becomes a, you know, every two or four year personality contest or a beauty contest. And it, it leads to this kind of debased situation. I, I should say, Ralph, maybe I'll mention this in this same breath. You had mentioned a few minutes ago about the public relations polls that indicate that trade unions are held in much, much higher regard than they have been in some recent decades. Well, that same polling will reveal that probably the lowest status that the presidential world has ever had of either party, people no longer look to the political leadership for very much authenticity or legitimacy. And let's not forget the union leadership. The the standing of the actual union leadership amongst their own members by those same polls will reveal that it is also eroded and become debased. And I think a lot of it is there's no bold, imaginative certainly not progressive leadership, to take on these questions. And as we're seeing with Sean Fain and the auto workers, if you provide sensible leadership that deals with workers' realities, they will follow. 
Uh, we saw that in rail up to the point until it was busted. Sean O'Brien at the Teamsters, you know, put an, an immense machine into operation, told Joe Biden and settled a very improved contract over what they would have had. But, you know, when you have a labor leadership that is lazy, unimaginative, rarely challenged, has a very timid view, a very limited world view, and they see their role more as administrator as opposed to leaders, this is the modern situation that we we face. We don't have much of a leadership, sadly. We have an administrator group, and they have administered the decline. As it said, you know, the, when the Democrats started taking money from Wall Street, they took the great economic issues off the table. That created a vacuum for the cultural issues, which the Republicans were delighted in exploiting, including Trump, who, by the way, was heard to say during the 2016 campaign, American workers are overpaid. And he wrecked the National Labor Relations Board when he became president, selected by the Electoral College. And he continued to freeze the minimum wage and opposed any efforts on Capitol Hill to raise it. And still 40 percent of the workers are voting for him, even with the polls today. So there's a lot of work to be done, a lot of interpersonal meetings in union halls, what's left of them, a lot of connection in the neighborhoods. It's got to become a political electoral movement if we're going to have anything that we call a labor movement. Well, on that note, we're, we're out of time. We've been talking with outstanding labor organizer, Chris Townsend, and we want to continue on these themes in the coming months, Chris. Can you tell our listeners how they can contact you if you have a website? Well, our inside organizing school, believe it or not, does not have a website. We've grown the thing with word of mouth only, and it's sustained over six years, bigger than ever. So uh, there's that, I guess. In other words, you do person-to-person -person organizing and not remote type of organizing, if, if there's such a thing. And you make Russell Mulkyber, the editor of the Capitol Hill Citizen, very happy because he believes in print and getting it to people so they can hold it in their own hands, talk to one another, and not be sucked into all the mismatch and distraction and nastiness of the Internet. Thank you, Chris Townsend. We want to have you on later to elaborate some more dimensions of the kind of agitation organization that's going on at various large corporate workplaces. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. We've been speaking with Chris Townsend. We will link to his work at ralphnaderradiohour.com. Up next, we're going to have a little free-form conversation with Ralph about various topics. But first, let's check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your Corporate Crime Reporter Morning Minute for Friday, October 6, 2023. I'm Russell Mokhyber. The U.K. Education Secretary, Gillian Keegan, is ordering all mobile phones banned from schools. Gillian Keegan will order schools to outlaw smartphones during lessons and also in breaks in a bid to end disruption and make it easier for pupils to focus. Keegan believes that mobile phones pose a serious challenge in terms of distraction, disruptive behavior, and bullying, a government source told the Daily Mail newspaper. It's one of the biggest issues that children and teachers have to grapple with, so she will set out a way forward to empower teachers to ban mobile phones from classrooms. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mocha. Thank you, Russell. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. I'm Steve Scroven, along with David Feldman, Hannah Feldman, and Ralph. Okay, Ralph, we want to talk about a few things before we go. First up, David. Ralph, there was an interview with you in the Washington Post that some people misconstrued. You were quoted as saying, we are stuck with Biden now. And then you said, I know the difference between fascism and autocracy. I'll take autocracy anytime. What did you mean by that? I meant that the Trumpster GOP is a fascist party. They believe in the corporate state, repression of the vote, censoring curriculum, censoring books, violent talk. They want to distort elections even beyond what they're distorted already. They have positions openly restricting the child safety net, like the 
child tax credit that cut child poverty in half until the Republicans blocked this extension in January 2022. They've come out against women's issues, clearly against a significant minimum wage. Some of them don't even believe in a minimum wage at all. Against worker health and safety regulations, they want to protect the massive tax cuts so the super rich and the big corporations pay less, a lower rate on the tax schedule than a working plumber or electrician or even a teacher. They are all for a bloated military budget. You know, Wall Street can do no wrong. And they amplify Wall Street in a whole variety of restrictions on civil liberties and civil rights. And while the Democrats are bad, and I said in the article that Biden was terrible on Wall Street and empire, they don't go that far. And so there's always a little wiggle room under autocracy to start the process of reversing. But the repression under fascism is pretty total and becomes extremely dictatorial. The one thing I did say was the Democrats don't suppress speech. And a couple of your emailers took me up on that. What I meant was the the Democratic Party. They don't suppress curriculums in schools and ban books and suppress the vote. But to give the listeners credit, they do suppress candidates of third parties. And that is suppression of freedom. And I should have qualified that. But sometimes you do all these qualifications being interviewed by a reporter, but they never appear in print because of space and they want space for photographs and all that. But on this one, I should have qualified it. The Republicans are very adamant and determined in repressing the vote all kinds of ways. We know them. They've been published. But the Democrats haven't gotten enough blame for repressing candidates that might give them a a minor challenge from a Green Party or some other party and make our democracy more competitive at election time. And they should be denounced for that. Has the anti-majoritarian strain always been there in this country, but now they get amplified through social media and podcasts? Yeah, because the Constitution is written to support minority rights. That's what the First Amendment is all about, to protect dissent. But it went overboard with the Electoral College, where you can get a minority of votes nationally and still get elected president as the Republicans did in 2000, 2016, for George W. Bush in 2000, and for Donald Trump in 2016. They lost the national popular vote, but they won the Electoral College vote. And so that is a very pronounced bias in favor of minority rule right at the top of the political ladder. But as some listeners suggested wrongfully, I never said vote for Biden. I believe that people should vote their conscience, regardless. I don't believe in tactical voting because that gets down to subordinating yourself to the least worst of the two-party duopoly. But when we're talking about the 2024 election, it's not just the presidency that's up. It's the House of Representatives, the Senate, governors of states, state legislators, local elected officials in cities and towns, villages around the country. And you've got to decide as a voter, where do you want to put your modest pressure or send your modest signal? And it's best to vote your conscience. Ralph, could you clarify what autocracy is in case, you know, to the casual reader, autocracy and fascism might seem kind of synonymous? Could you clarify what the distinction is? Yeah, autocracy has many faces, and one of them is restrict electoral candidates. And so one aspect of Democratic Party autocracy is they work overtime to keep parties like the Green Party off the ballot, which is a a violation of their First Amendment rights, among other things, to speak freely, petition, and assemble as candidates. And the Democrats have helped to mature the corporate state in Washington. They've allowed Washington to be taken over when they're in charge more and more by Wall Street. They put in nominees coming from corporate firms into positions of regulatory and cabinet power. Look who they put in as head of the Federal Reserve or Secretary of the Treasury or the current Secretary of Defense is from Raytheon Corporation. 
He was executive with, with that manufacturer of weapons of mass destruction in Massachusetts. And they have opposed agendas in their party plank to go after corporate crime, fraud, and abuse. They don't take a stand against the takeover of Medicare and Medicaid by corporate contractors, especially under the Medicare disadvantage program. So the examples can go on and on, Hannah. They have been shoulder to shoulder, not entirely, because they have a good Federal Trade Commission now and, and a good head of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. But on the really big issues of Empire and Wall Street, they're really shoulder to shoulder with the GOP in maturing an ever deeper corporate state. As I said previously, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt sent a message to Congress in 1938 to establish a commission to investigate concentration of corporate power in our country, he added the phrase warning Congress that, and I'm paraphrasing him, that when private power controls public government, that is fascism. He used those words. So would it be wrong, just to follow up, to say that the Democrats and autocracy, they're promoting their own interests, they're selfish, whereas the Republicans, the fascists, more actively out to get us is kind of what I'm taking from this. It's, are they selfish or are they actually malicious? Well, they are malicious, obviously. I mean, you can see in how they treat minorities, how they try to block people from voting in certain districts and precincts. Their language is in accordance with that prejudice. There's uh, the bias against immigrants goes way beyond abusing the asylum right by immigrants. There's no doubt about the difference on that score. But, you know, on the, the ownership of the commons by the American people, the public lands, public airways, the Democrats are just like the Republicans. They shove it over to control by corporations, radio, TV stations, timber, gas, oil, coal companies, and public lands. And I mean, there's a whole list of examples where the Democrats have disgraced their earlier heritage decades ago as being somewhat in favor of working families and their rights. Democrats will eat me if they catch me, but Republicans are actively hunting me. <laughs> you, yeah, you can, you can put it that way. Uh, the, the Democrats let the corporations take over, and so do the Republicans. But the Republicans are harassing more and more of the people and intimidating them and blocking them from voting and making clear that they want them out of the arena of power, except those that rubber stamp the Trumpster party line. Speaking of Republicans, Ralph, yesterday you tweeted out this. I want to Quote it to you and then have you elaborate on it. You wrote that the eight renegade GOP members who voted against Kevin McCarthy are consummate hypocrites. They say it's to stop excessive spending, mostly on the social safety net. You didn't challenge massive corporate tax cuts, corporate welfare bonanzas, and fraud against the government. All of which expands the deficit, which is supposed to be their concern. And that was clearly stated on C-SPAN recently in an interview of Congressman Bob Good from Virginia, the area of Thomas Jefferson, ironically. And he, all he could do is talk about excessive federal spending. And the moderator never asked him a question. Well, you're worried about deficits. What about all these tax cuts on the super rich big corporations? What about hundreds of billions of dollars a year shoveled out to corporate welfare, bailouts, handouts, giveaways, subsidies? What about the Fraud on Medicare, $60 billion a year there, and the fraud on the military contracting process, etc. No, he didn't mention it. And C-SPAN never asks these kinds of questions. They just let these politicians bloviate without asking fair and critical questions and following up. So, Ralph, talk specifically what's going on in the House of Representatives with the former Speaker McCarthy. Well, eight defiant Republican members of the House, amazing energy. Imagine if we had eight progressive members of the House with that kind of energy. They pulled the rug out from Kevin's majority. And so he ended up with a slight minority, and he could not defeat them, so they ousted him. Here's what people need to know. A speaker under our Constitution can be selected from anybody in the country. 
They don't have to be members of the House of Representatives. They could phone up Newt Gingrich, heaven forbid, and say, we want to vote for you to become speaker. Come on down. Or they could call former Governor Christine Todd Whitman, a liberal Republican of New Jersey, and say, we want to have you as a speaker. They could call up Steve Scrovan, Hannah Feldman, David Feldman, say, do you want to be speaker? Now you're talking, Ralph. Now you're talking. (laughs) See? So a lot of people don't know that. The second thing is in Article 1, Section 5 of the Constitution, a two-thirds majority of the House can expel Matt Goetz and Bob Good and the other renegades. They could just expel them from the House with two-thirds. Well, they could get two-thirds because the Speaker McCarthy Republican supporters are outraged, and they're in the vast majority of Republicans in the House, and the Democrats would like to get rid of the renegade Republicans. So we'll see how that plays out in the coming struggle. But I have to believe that this is going to damage the Republicans in next year election. I want to thank our guest again, Chris Townsend. For those of you listening on the radio, that's our show. For you podcast listeners, stay tuned for some bonus material we call The Wrap-Up, featuring Francesco DeSantis. And in case you haven't heard, a transcript of this program will appear on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour Substack site soon after the episode is posted. Subscribe to us on our Ralph Nader Radio Hour YouTube channel. And for Ralph's weekly column, you can get it for free by going to nader.org. For more from Russell Mokhyber, go to corporatecrimereporter.com. The American Museum of Tort Law is going virtual. Go to tortmuseum.org to explore the exhibits, take a virtual tour, and learn about iconic tort cases from history. The producers of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour are Jimmy Lee Wirt and Matthew Marin. Our executive producer is Alan Minsky. Our theme music, Stand Up, Rise Up, was written and performed by Kemp Harris. Our proofreader is Elizabeth Solomon. Our associate producer is Hannah Feldman. Our social media manager is Stephen Wendt. Join us next week on the 501st episode of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you, everybody. Keep reading, keep thinking, keep buying books. The online progressive bookstore in our country that I would recommend, so you don't have to go to Amazon, is at Counterpunch. Look it up. Stand we